Good morning and welcome to the Tuesday, April 16th meeting of the RTC, Regional Transportation Committee. Uh, I'm Wynne Shaw, your chair, and um, the meeting is now in order. Uh, I will open the time for public comment. Do we have anyone here, Cam, for public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, give it a second. But I do not see any hands raised online or in person. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Um, uh, we will close the period for public comment and move to our uh, agenda item, uh, the uh, approval of the meeting summary from our March 19th meeting. Were there questions? It was the, distributed uh, as attachment A. there's no uh, question, then I would look for a motion to approve as distributed. Director Mills. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve the agenda or the, thank you. excuse me, the minutes. The, the meeting summary, yes, thank you. And a second. Second. Thank you, Director Wheel. Uh, those in favor of approving the uh, RTC committee meeting summary from March 19th as distributed, say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The meeting summary is approved, ayes have it. Action items, Federal Transit Administration, uh, Section 5310 Fiscal Year 2024 Funding Awards. Uh, Travis Noon is presenting. Travis is a program manager uh, for administration and finance. Thanks, Travis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, appreciate everybody's time today. Uh, Travis Noon and I am presenting the 2024-2025 Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 awards for your consideration today. Uh, just some quick background, Dr. Cog is the designated recipient of these funds for the Denver or urbanized area. Uh, and these funds are used to support capital operating and mobility management projects throughout the region that meet the needs of older adults and individuals with disabilities. Uh, we generally release a yearly call for projects and we released this call for projects in November of 2023. Uh, we received uh, 10, or, or 10 propo or, you know, proposals from 10 organizations requesting nearly $4.1 million. Uh, and there is approximately $3.5 million available for the period between July 1, 2024 and June 30, 2025. Um, all these applications are reviewed and scored by an independent panel of experts in the region uh, who make the recommendations for you all today. Uh, these are the recommended awards here on the screen. They're also in your agenda packet. Um, the panel that was reviewing these uh, prioritized continuing operating projects and mobility management projects. Those are generally continuing support for uh, projects that have been going on for quite a while throughout the region. Um, and then when it came to the capital requests for vehicles, uh, they, using the same sort of logic, prioritized replacing vehicles to keep services going over the expansion vehicles. Uh, there were two software projects that weren't recommended. Uh, there were concerns there about the applicability of those the funds for those projects, but also the readiness of those projects to, uh, to take off. So uh, we do have the recommended motion for you all here on the board, but I'm happy to answer any questions the committee has. Thank you. Are there questions for Travis? Director Stewart. Am I on? There we go. Um, I see that the Brumfield one wasn't recommended and it says it may not be ready. Is that, why was that one not um, recommended? Uh, there was, so with the Brumfield one, they were requesting an additional license for their routing software. Uh, those types of projects really are more suited for operating expenses because they're ongoing yearly expenses as opposed to capital requests like this one. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Director Clark. Good morning. Um, just being new here, I'm just curious about the how the process works with respect to Dr. Cog also being an awarded project and how that lives within the system. I mean, obviously it makes sense, but just curious, it just stands out. Sure. Travis, can you shed some light there? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So Dr. Cog uh, did, the Area Agency on Aging of Dr. Cog submitted a proposal. Um, this is for the 
uh, choice services transportation program that's run on that side. Um, so they submitted a proposal just like everybody else and it's competitive just like all the other projects. Um, and this is sort of a, a reason why we, as Dr. Cog's staff, don't score these proposals. Um, so it's all an independent panel. I'm just a part of it to be a subject matter expert and make sure it's allocated accordingly, but otherwise it is uh, outside of Dr. Cog's hands on what these recommendations are. Can you tell us some of the uh, components to the scoring? Sure, it depends on the project type. Um, so operating projects are scored based on financial need, uh, need for the service in the region. Uh, same with mobility management, it's financial need, need for service in the region for the most part, as well as the compatibility with uh, the coordinated transit plan from Dr. Cogs. Uh, transit planning, uh, the vehicle replacements are scored, again, based on the compatibility with the transit plan, but also uh, scored based on the need, so the useful life of the vehicle that's being replaced, so mileage, uh, age of those vehicles that are being replaced. Uh, expansion, again, it's looking at need and then the compatibility as well as the software with our transit plans. Other questions? Uh, Director McKinley, you had your hand up, but I, okay. <laughs> All right, then I would look for a motion. Excellent. Thank you, Director Cook, is there a second? Thank you, Director Baker. Those in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. Ayes have it. Motion is adopted. Thank you. Next up is uh, update to taking action on Regional Vision Zero Plan, Emily Kleinfelter. Safety and Regional Vision Z Zero Planner. Thanks, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, yes, hi, I'm Emily Kleinfelter. I'm the Safety Regional Vision Zero Planner here for Dr. Cog, and I'm going to be giving you a little bit of an update um, to the work that we've been working on uh, over the last year to um, take a strategic update to our Taking Action on Regional Vision Zero Action Plan. So we're going to go over the objectives. Um, so the, the first sort of overall objective for this update was to take a holistic approach to updating the plan. Um, to create a valuable and sustainable approach to addressing safety in the region. Um, and so we looked at developing, as, in addition to that, a, an, a, an accompanying story map that um, creates a, a visual way to represent the story, sorry, the uh, crash profiles in the region. And then we also made sure to update the uh, action plan to be accessible, um, to meet the accessibility requirements that we are required to meet. So just a little background on the way that we did this update. Um, taking action on Regional Vision Zero was adopted in June of 2020. And so we started a strategic update to this plan in February of 2023 last year. Um, we brought that to um, RTC and TAC for a briefing in February. And then um, we started from between in March to September of 2023, we um, underwent some objective workshops where we um, went through each of the six objectives with, that we identify in taking action on Region of Vision Zero and went through all of the actions identified to um, identify the, the uh, priority for those actions. Um, then in October, we hosted an in-person workshop here in this room, actually, with all of our stakeholders from the Regional Vision Zero work group and um, helped us sort of create a timeline for those actions of the six objectives. Um, then in January and February of this year, we brought, uh, we, we had a public comment period where we put the uh, strategic update out for, for public feedback. And then um, in March of, of this year, we brought this to TAC for um, their approval. And then now here we are um, in April for RTC and hopefully for board tomorrow. So just a little um, background, taking action on Regional Vision Zero again was um, adopted in June of 2020. 
and it has a bunch of different components in it. And so this strategic update was really looking at um, only updating a few of those main chapters in the plan. So we looked at chapter six, the implementation plan, which is really what I like to think of the meat and potatoes of, of the plan. It's really um, laying out the objectives and those um, actionable strategies for us to, to get to our goal of zero. Um, and then again, I mentioned that we created an accompanying story map, which um, we, we, in this action plan, we went through and we did a really intensive crash analysis of the region um, based on all the area types and came up with the uh, specific crash profiles for those area types. And we then uh, display that in this really new create great tool of, a, of the regional Vision Zero story map. And that was uh, published late last year. Again, we hosted these workshops. Um, virtual ones were first, and those were just in uh, virtual to try to kind of set the set the tone um, to check in on how we have been working on the 2020 actions that we identified. And then we did virtual uh, workshops on those six objectives that I mentioned um, to just kind of get an understanding of the uh, difficulty to implement the actions and the uh, overall impact of the action. Do we feel like it's a really high impact or maybe lower impact? And then lastly, we held that in-person workshop here where we, um, as you can see in this picture, sort of worked with the stakeholders to identify the timelines of when we wanted to achieve um, these actions based on the feedback we received in those virtual um, workshops. And then we held a public comment period again from January 29th to February 27th of this year. Um, we did a couple of different ways of getting the word out. We, uh, we created a web page on Social Pinpoint where it was a way for folks to come there and provide feedback and review the plan updates. Um, unfortunately, we didn't receive as many uh, feedbacks online as we hoped, but we did get some good uh, content from that online engagement uh, resource. And unfortunately, a majority of those comments though were outside of the scope of the update work that we did. Um, so we did note them and we'll be sure to um, take those into account when we, be, uh, when we update the plan in the future. So some notable outcomes of the update. Uh, we have a letter from our Dr. Cog Executive Director, Doug Rex, here with us today. Um, this is something that's really notable that um, is, is quite frankly um, putting us ahead of a lot of the other MPOs and, and just really setting the stage for um, what we as a region want to commit to. And so um, we really think this is a great step in, in setting the tone for the entire plan and for our, our goals as a region. Um, and then again, it's sort of status quo for most plans these days to have an executive summary. So we made sure to include that in the plan. Um, and then we updated our list of uh, countermeasures. So the previous list of countermeasures glossary was about 70 or more countermeasures, which um, it, when you do the TIP application process, you're referred to those. And so uh, we actually refined those down to be similar or to not just be similar, to actually be the exact same countermeasures that FHWA uh, proposes as their proven safety countermeasures. Um, so there's a 28 of them that I'll touch on in just a moment. Um, and then the last but not least, again, the meat and potatoes is that implementation plan uh, that we updated. So those proven safety countermeasures, uh, again, these are reflecting the FHWA list of 28 proven safety countermeasures. And these are uh, sort of segmented into different emphasis areas, which are speed management, intersections, roadway departure, pedestrian bicyclists, and also cross-cutting. So sort of can be multiple of those uh, different areas. And so we really wanted to kind of narrow down the types of countermeasures that we feel are the best to address safety in the region by reflecting what FHWA is uh, doing for best practice. And then those meat and potatoes, the, the implementation plan component. So the, it's, it's very similar to the previous plan with a couple of more um, important key elements to identify here. So what's new here is that we identify the supporting partners. Um, in the previous plan, we just identified all of the different stakeholders who would be uh, working on an action. But here we now identify the lead action partner or the lead, uh, action lead, excuse me, and then the support partners so that we kind of have a, a better understanding of who actually is going to be in charge of implementing these different strategies. Um, and then another thing to note that's new here are the expected impact, which helps us identify the priority of these actions. Um, and so 
those are again you can see here that we've got medium medium high all the way to, to low or even very high and so um, those are feedback based on the regional vision zero work group helping us determine do we believe that these actions are going to help move us closer to the the overall goal of zero and then lastly um, we also include time frame there and so you'll see that um, we have different time frames, whether it's an ongoing action that we're currently working on, something that we want to uh, implement in the immediate, so zero, uh, sorry, near term to next two years, um, or two to five, and then um, five to ten years. And so we sort of had a, we, you know, we, we can't implement everything at the at once, and so we had to prioritize what are the most impactful actions that might need to take a little bit more time that we want to prioritize um, putting at the top of the list to implement immediately. So just a reminder, um, apologies that this is a little bit, um, this was for TAC and I apologize that I didn't update the, the color on here. So the little green dot should be over on April because um, we are in April right now. But um, just to, to remind you of where we've been and where we are now. So March, we did the update kickoff and then um, made our way through the workshops through, through 2023. And then in January of this, January and February of this year, we did public comment um, as, as necessary. And then um, We've taken it to, to TAC for their recommendation for approval uh, last month, and now here we are at RTC for your um, proposed, or sorry, approval, and um, then we will be taking it to board tomorrow for hopeful uh, future adoption. So I would like to, uh, I guess, move to recommend to the board of directors the draft taking action on Regional Vision Zero. Thank you. Uh, Any first, questions as well? First, let's let's go to questions. Are there questions for Emily? Oh, great presentation. Oh, okay, Director Cook. Hey, did I turn it on? I did. Um, <laughs> so Emily, that story map, I'm just uh, so impressed with it. I almost wish you could demonstrate it because it seems like it's a really fabulous tool for anybody interested in this. Um, but, Mostly, I just wanted to say thanks for developing it and, and work on that. Uh, there were some comments that talked about the dated nature of the data, but one thing I noted is that the website, um, the page, the Vision Zero page on the website does include updated data. It's almost a live version of the report, so I thought that ameliorated that quite a bit. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just note that we actually have a, a full-time employee who is working on uh, what we, a regional crash data consortium effort. And so we recognize that crash data um, has its challenges um, in, in the region. And so we are, we are working to address that with Eric and his, his work with the region and identifying the needs and um, ways to address those challenges because absolutely having the most uh, timely and um, best quality data is what's going to help us be able to get closer to that target of zero. Thank you. And you did an excellent job with the media when, when that map was launched. So thank you for that as well. Yes, thank you. And I'm Question. happy to send along a link to the, to the map. Um, yeah, it's a very exciting tool that we've created. Um, I'm happy to yeah, send that along. Great. All right, other questions? If not, I'll look for the proposed motion. So moved, Director Guzman. Thank you very much. Uh, is there a second? Thank you, Director McKinley. It's moved and seconded to uh, recommend to the Board of Directors the draft taking action on Regional Vision Zero. Uh, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Motion is adopted. Thank you very much. Sure. Next, we have discussion items, and E-470 is here to present to us. Uh, Jacob Brieger, Ma Manager of Multimodal Transportation Planning, uh, will introduce. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. So we all know E-470. We've all probably driven on E-470 multiple times. Um, but in seeing this presentation a couple times already, I learned quite a lot. I think you will as well. The E-470 Public Highway Authority has actually been engaged in a lot of 
um, planning, master planning, a lot of project work. So we wanted to kind of give you an update on where uh, where E470 is at with all of their great planning and project initiatives. So to help us do that, I'd like to introduce Neil Thompson, Interim Executive Director of E470, and Jessica Carson, Strategic D Director of Strategic Communication. I hope I got that right. Close. <laughs> so go ahead. thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you, Neil and Jessica, and welcome. Thank you for having us here. It's a pleasure to be at Dr. Cog. Um, again, my name is Neil Thompson. I'm the Interim Executive Director at E470, meaning that our board is currently looking for a permanent Executive Director, so please be patient with me. Um, I'm actually a civil engineer, so I'm kind of doing two jobs. I'm in charge of the capital prog projects as well as currently Interim. Jessica is our Director of Government Affairs, um, and she's the super communicator. I'm just the engineer, so I will <laughs> try to do my best, but Jessica will um, kick us off here. Neil, Dan's here. Here's what we're going to cover today. Um, thank you so much for having us. A lot of familiar faces. Director Shaw, Director Mulvey um, serve on our board as well, so um, thank you for the time. We appreciate it. And as Jacob mentioned, we have been going around, we're calling them kind of road shows. We really want to get out in the community, talk to our member jurisdictions, our partners, and help uh, educate and learn what we have going on. So if you've heard some of this, we apologize. Hopefully you'll take away something new today. So about us, we are a political subdivision of the state of Colorado. We are owned and governed by our eight member jurisdictions. Those are uh, the jurisdictions, the five cities and three counties that the 47 miles does run through. So we, as I mentioned, we have a couple of our non-voting members here, and you'll see on the left there, those are our voting members. We are the 47 miles. We've been um, around since 1991. We opened our last segment up north in 2003. In 2001, to celebrate our 10-year anniversary, we launched our Transportation Safety Foundation. Um, this is a huge initiative for us, and we just recently closed our 2024 grant program. We received 70 uh, grant applications, which was a record, and then our Transportation Safety Foundation Board will meet next Thursday and vote to award $60,000 to um, some of those recipients. Uh, we are non-user, we are user financed. We do not receive any tax funding. A lot of people don't know this or it's a misconception. So no state, local, or federal tax funding uh, to help maintain, operate, expand, and um, run the road. We have 1.3 billion in bond debt. So that's our mortgage on the road, like you have a mortgage on your house. And we issue about 100 to 115 million in those mortgage payments annually. We're scheduled to be paid off in 2041. This shows you our transaction history over the last several years. I think it goes without saying that orange line is the pandemic. Um, we did see that decrease as everyone did. Um, the yellow line is at the top. We have since um, rebounded to pre-pandemic levels. So we're just um, surpassing those 2019 levels and continue to set monthly records. I do wanna note that during the pandemic, our board of directors fully supported a reduction in toll rates. Um, so we were the only toll agency across the country to reduce toll rates during COVID. Um, and before that, we actually froze toll rates starting in 2018. Um, so we have not had a toll rate increase since 2017. And our board did just this year vote to freeze those rates again. Um, we also eliminated fees as bonds were paid off. We had our vehicle registration fees that were um, created to help fund the original um, maintenance and construction of the road, and those sunsetted, and we did uh, retire those in 2018. We also paid off our vehicle, sorry, our highway expansion fees, and those were retired in 2017. Um, my final slide before turning it back over to Neil, um, again, just wanna reiterate the in the community efforts. I touched on the Transportation Safety Foundation. Um, in addition to the grant program, we also support after prom programs. So we um, sent checks to about 20 high schools in the region to help support um, healthy uh, activities after prom. We also have our E470 Good Guys team. This has been around for about 15 years. This is solely volunteer. These are E470 employees that um, donate their time and create activities and um, bring in donations, especially around the holidays. We adopt families, we uh, provide gifts to the Salvation Gift Giving Tree, and then other activities throughout the year. 
our jurisdictional partnerships. We want to get out in our community. We uh, represent at fairs. We have booths. We educate on the road. We give out toll credits and some fun E-470 swag. And then the last is what we're doing here today, and that's connecting with our partners. So with that, I'll turn it over to Neil to continue. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so one of the big things I've learned in my long career is um, collaboration and partnership is things done. Um, and this is a list of, I'm not going to go through all these, but this is how we collaborate with our regional partners. Uh, you can see the various jurisdictions up and down our corridor um, with these improvements. So some safety improvements here, quite a few trail improvements, as well as new interchanges. Um, what we found is that when you collaborate, things get done. Um, I would say it's been great working with Dr. Cog also and Jacob and his team um, as we go through our, our planning this year. Talking about our planning, so this year we will update our master plan. That's kind of like your tip, I think. Um, it, we look at the traffic trends, the forecasts, certainly with Dr. Cog's models. Um, and try and plan what projects we need to have. Um, we are seeing congestion on our road, as Jessica said. Traffic has returned to pre-pandemic levels, and so we need to address the congestion. We will update our capital plan and our master plan this year, um, and we do have a lot of capital projects uh, on the docket already. Um, the last master plan was 2020, and we estimated $1.5 billion worth of improvements. And as you know, since then, uh, we've seen massive inflation in construction and highway and everything else. So that $1.5 billion, I'm sure, is going to increase significantly. The current large project that we're doing now is to add a third lane. Um, because of the congestion I talked about um, between I-70 and 104th Avenue in Adams County, um, it's centered around Denver International Airport, of course, where we get a lot of our traffic from. Um, as I say, it's adding a third lane. It's also adding a couple of new interchanges in Aurora at 38th Avenue and 48th Avenue. And you've all heard of Aurora Highlands. Um, that's a large development out there um, that we build. They've asked us to build an interchange for them, and that's what we're doing right now. Um, we're also extending our trail. I should mention that our board has been very supportive to um, extend our regional trail, which goes along E470, whenever we're doing these major projects. But we're adding about six miles on this project, and I'll show you a slide later on. We've got a gap at Pena Boulevard. Um, kind of tough to get a trail across Pena Boulevard. If you ever have any ideas how to do that, I appreciate <laughs> you letting us know. We do have an idea, but it has some challenges. This is the 38th Avenue interchange I talked about that will um, primarily serve Aurora Highlands in Aurora, and we hope to open that um, by Memorial Day. Also had to adjust our tolling plaza. Um, this is our new tolling plaza that we activated a couple of months ago, again, to accommodate that new interchange. And the developer uh, purchased our old maintenance facility. Um, they did not want an uh, industrial-looking facility as they went into their development, and so we are building a, a replacement facility adjacent to our high quarter building right now, and that will be finished in July of this year. I want to talk about trails just a little bit. Um, um, as I said, our board is very supportive of these. Um, building another six miles this year. Um, up at the very top there, you probably can't see it, but it's the uh, Adams County came to us a couple of years ago and asked us to relocate our trail instead of running along the highway um, into their future regional park called Riverdale Bluffs. And so we've partnered with them and we're funding a good portion of that project. Um, and so that'll be tremendous user experience, I think, rather than going alongside the road they can go through this beautiful new park. And down south, um, this is an interesting one. This is the High Plains Trail connection to the Cherry Creek Trail at Parker Road. You've probably heard about this um, when they lifted the bridge over Parker Road last year. 
Um, that project will be finished this year, and it will be a beautiful connection between our trail and Cherry Creek. That started in 2016 when we signed an IGA with Parker. So it takes a long time to get these trail projects done. We call this the United Nations of Trails because I think <laughs> there was eight jurisdictions, Lone Tree, Centennial, Aurora, all the jurisdictions you can think of. And we're excited to see that come to fruition next, this year. This is what I was talking about. This is a little bit difficult to see, perhaps. It's an aerial looking northwards toward Peña Boulevard. And this is how we think we can get the trail across Peña Boulevard with a dashed yellow line. The solid yellow line to the top and bottom is where we will build it this year and next year. The dashed line, um, we think we can get it underneath Peña Boulevard under an existing bridge that I'll show you here. So it's um, badly eroded, this bridge um, in brown there. Hopefully you can see it. It's silted in. So there's lots of work to do. It's on Denver property. So we need to have an arrangement with Denver to get our trail underneath their bridge. Um, and the FAA is involved. So, again, some administrative <laughs> hurdles, but uh, we're confident we'll get this connected at some point. And it'll be a, a really good amenity for um, the people who live uh, near T470. Last couple of slides before I turn it back to Jessica. I also partner with the commercial trucking industry. Um, a couple of years ago, we worked very hard with the CSP State Patrol to get E470 designated as a hazmat route. That might sound a little bit unusual, but what I understand is about 90 odd percent of hazmat loads are actually gasoline trucks going to your local gas station. So our idea is if we can get the gas trucks off of your local streets and onto a safer facility like E470, that's a win-win uh, on the safety side of it. Um, E470 is a very relatively safe facility. It's well designed. Um, so we thought that was a, a good initiative that would help our neighboring cities and counties. The other thing is we have um, offered an incentive to the trucking industry to use E470, again, to get trucks off local streets and on T470. So there's a discounted toll rate, I think, in the mornings, I think, um, to get the trucks off E470. My final slide, and like Emily, I have a passion for safety. Um, we have a lot to try to improve the safety on E470. Wrong way drivers is a terrible thing when it happens. It's usually a high speed, inevitably very serious um, accident. So we've invested a lot of money there, and we're looking right now at a new, new initiative with thermal cameras to try to detect those wrong way drivers. So as they go the wrong way, uh, we get an instant alert in our 24 hour, seven day command center so we can get the help out that is needed. Flash up uh, on our electronic signs, wrong way driver, um, cautious. Um, the cable barrier that we've installed in the median has uh, saved countless crossover accidents, and we're installing um, more um, uh, to prevent the accidents that run off the road uh, or ramps. Deer fence, we're installing miles of that deer fence this year as well. I'll pause here and I'll turn it back to Jessica. So as you saw on the previous slide, um, we do have around 50 cameras along the 47 miles of our toll roads. We have virtually 100% coverage of our facility. So we have our 24-7 traffic management center that is always looking at the road. Um, that's part of their job is to look for debris, look for stranded motorists. We've trained our staff. If you're driving home or to work and you see someone on the side, you call um, the traffic management center and get someone out there. So we have our free 24-7 roadside assistance. They're out there as a service just to help customers with flat tires, um, gas refills, just any assistance they may need um, so that we keep that safety as a top priority, as Neil mentioned. Um, in 2023, we had about a 12-minute average response time to service those customers, and we did help over nearly 10,000 customer assists along the road and fielded over 15,000 um, calls to the traffic management center. And in the red there, you'll see the star 470. That was recently implemented um, in late 2022. And so any 
cellular coverage, just dial star 470 and you'll be automatically directed to a live agent in our traffic management center. Environmental stewards, this is another piece that is very important to us. Um, we are adjacent to the Cherry Creek and Bar Milton, Milton watersheds. And if you're not familiar with obtaining or um, maintaining an MS4 permit, it's very extensive and a lot of work. And Neil's team has done a great job to get that and keep up on the education and all the requirements needed and um, follow up to keep that permit. Um, we actually have a rain barrel workshop that we're hosting at our headquarters next Friday. And so that will be for 30 participants to come in and be educated on that rain barrel effort. Um, we also educate customers on how to reduce pollutants through their own yard waste and travel and put that out in, on our website and through all of our newsletters. We also have EV fast charging stations at our headquarters. We just upgraded those in 2022, so you receive about an 80% charge in 30 minutes or less advanced, but that was the end of that. Um, also, solar power. We wanted the first agencies in the country to go solar power toll road. Um, we have over 15 solar arrays along our facility, and that's produced 12,000 million, million um, kilowatts of solar energy. Um, to kind of uh, boil that down, we offset about 44% of our energy years, energy needs on an annual basis. Interoperability. Um, so you probably are very familiar with this, but we work with um, the CDOT and their tolling arm, CTIO. So we do the back office service for all of the express lanes in the state of Colorado and also Northwest Parkway. So we do that as a partner partnership to the state and also a convenience to our customers. So that's one customer service, one tag, one account. Um, it just adds for better experience and more convenience. This is something coming very soon, which I'm very excited to talk about, national interoperability. So this extends past Colorado. Um, we've been working towards this for many years, and our board of directors approved to join the central hub back in the fall of 2022. What this means is if you have an express toll account and you travel outside of state lines to Kansas, Oklahoma, or Texas, you'll be able to use your express toll account to pay for any toll roads that you go on. And it'll just be automatically deducted from your account, similar to when you travel in Colorado. And vice versa, if anyone from those states comes to us and have an, has an account in their home state, their tolls will be deducted. So this adds for convenience, customer service, and also reduces expenses because we don't have to reach out and send bills to those out-of-state customers. And this will be coming in June of this year. So coming soon. I'm very excited. Just a couple more slides before we open to questions. Um, just want to give you an idea of the volume that travels through our back office. In 2023, we um, had over 150 million transactions that we processed, and we fielded nearly a million customer service calls to our call center. We looked at 80 million images, so those are the customers that do not have an express toll account. We take a picture of the front and rear, rear license plate, and we look at those images so that we can correctly identify the registered vehicle owner. Um, bottom right there, we have 1.3 million express toll accounts in the state and about 2.3 million active transponders. Last year, we opened 175,000 new express toll accounts, which was about a 16% increase over the year before. So final slide, just want to close on our commitment to customer service. We do an annual customer experience survey every year, and we open it for two months. And we had about 45,000 customers respond this last year. You'll see out of um, five stars, we received 4.66 in customer satisfaction, 4.6, one out of five for road conditions. Most important to our customers is that we're kept free of snow in the winter, um, which I think our Neil's team does a great job doing. And um, the number one reason customers choose us is to save time. And that 43 point million that was from a third party economic impact study shows that with E470 being in existence, customers say um, we save customers 43.2 million in travel time saved on an annual basis. So with that, open to any questions. Thank you, are there questions? Director Mills. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. And I'm actually excited to see the more that I guess that regional toll in in the middle part of the country be accepted with our tags. I was just driving through Kansas and Texas uh, several days ago and watching what I would have paid if I had their tag versus not, and having to only do the license plate toll um, would have saved a lot of money. So I. I appreciate you doing that. Is, is there a way that 
Is there a movement to do this nationwide, not just regionally? Um, I know there are tolls I've driven through in Florida and, and, and many other states. And, you know, I, I, I appreciate this part, <laughs> but <laughs> how can we get this going nationwide? A great question. And that was actually an initiative um, from around 2012. It was called MAP21, and that was to create national interoperability across the entire country. So if you look at the top right, you'll see the four regions. So you have your western region, the central region, which is what we're joining, the southeast, and then essentially the easy pass re region up in the northeast. So the central hub and the southeast region actually just connected last summer. So um, we will be able to, uh, once we join the central hub, we will then work to join with the southeast hub in probably the following year. So then that will open up all the southeast hub states, and eventually we will extend to Easy Pass and then hopefully the western hub. Western hub is harder because they have legislation in place that doesn't allow them to share customer information outside of state lines. So that one we're running into a challenge with. But the ultimate goal is to have all the hubs connected. That would be great. I appreciate that. And just for informational purposes, uh, the Kansas Turnpike, they're going to go all cashless starting this summer. And I paid my last cash toll just several days ago over there. So <laughs> 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 I think it's June or something they're doing that. So. Yep, July and um, new back office as well. And you mentioned it at the beginning, but because of that, um, partnership, you will pay the lower toll rate with your tag at all those agencies. That's essentially why I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I think those of us who grew up on the East Coast remember throwing that quarter into the bucket, right, you know, and hoping it lands. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Other questions? Yes. I think this is for you, I don't know, but Jeff. Question about the toll credits that are accumulating to the state from E-470's operations, which are a, a huge potential value to all of our uh, government entities throughout, the, throughout this region in particular. Do you know if those toll credits that accumulate due to E-470 accumulate to the state and under the control of CDOT to utilize, or do they accumulate to E-470 to utilize that as far as credits. So under federal law, um, any any public any public highway facility that is funded through tolls, even if it's through a quasi government entity like E four seventy and not a state DOT or another another uh, fully public entity accumulates toll credits and toll credits can be used to match federal transportation funds. So when an entity then expends federal transportation funds on a project, can tap into toll credits to provide the match for those federal funds so that you essentially can 100% federally fund a project. And I imagine that due to E-470 has accumulated lots of toll credits, and I'm just curious if those accumulate to sort of a state toll credit account and are captured in CDOT's kind of toll credit account, or if E470 kind of maintains those toll credits and has access to decide how to use those toll credits? Well, I'm afraid I'm, that's the first question I've heard like that. Um, E470 is separate from the state, as you know. Well, the toll credit um, philosophy is something I have not heard of before, so apologize for my ignorance on that. All right, I, I'll flag it as an issue. I'd love to explore further if we can get with the right folks at E-470. Happy to do that. Interesting, and I had an observation that uh, if those states in the Western Hub can't give us the data to query, could we allow them to query our data with their data and tell us where there is a match. In other words, they might be processing some of our uh, toll people, but their data wouldn't have to leave, yet from a customer perspective, it would look like their billing would come through E470. Kind of a... Yeah, that's a great question. Um, with the Western Hub, it would be somewhat of a one-way um, partnership. So our customers, 
going there, we could share their information. So yes, our customers could be billed seamlessly and not receive a bill or have to stop. It would be their customers coming here or to the central hub, but uh. they would still be billed because we wouldn't receive their information. Um, with that being said, Washington um, has looked into possibly joining um, the central hub since the California region is, is dealing with those challenges. Um, but that is an option. Interesting, thank you. Other questions? Great presentation, thank you. We appreciate you very much. Good partnerships. Next up is uh, Metro Vision Amendments uh, with Zachary Feldman, Manager uh, Data and Analytics. And are you not Dr. Feldman? Uh, I am Dr. Feldman. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were. Uh, my wife's a real doctor, so uh, <laughs> her, her colleagues say I'm an O doctor. Oh, that kind of doctor. That kind of doctor. <laughs> the data um, doctor. <laughs> um, I'm an economist here with Dr. Cog um, and the manager of the data and analytics team. Um, just a quick overview of the MetroVision um, performance measures. So these are help to, are used to help monitor progress towards regional outcomes. And just want to emphasize that these are not uh, being used to evaluate individual jurisdictions or projects. So we're really looking at these at a um, entire region-wide level. So just a little bit of text from MetroVision. Dr. Cog may update and refine these measures as needed should improved methods and data sets become available. So these measures are based on often publicly available data that we don't necessarily produce ourselves. So sometimes in order to improve them, we will change some of our data sources or how we're measuring them. And in other cases, we have to because some of those data sources no longer exist. So today we're talking about um, high-risk areas. So these are areas where there's either floodplain or um, high risk of fire. And we're looking at both employment and housing in these areas. Just a bit of kind of background as to why we're making this change. Um, Colorado State Forest Service develops these um, maps. Um, we were using the 2012 map, um, which had a measure called wildfire threat, and they've pretty drastically changed their methodology. So the underlying um, models they're using have been drastically changed, so we're going to get a very different map. And they've also changed um, to a much more detailed satellite um, data set, which is going to also lead to changes. Um, so now there's a new measure called burn probability um, that we'll be using. And there was actually even an, uh, an interim update to their methodology that was um, a little less um, extreme. But now we're so basically two methodology changes on, which is leading to this change. Um, we're going to change both the baseline and the target. So what we'll see in the coming map is that the area being designated high risk change drastically, so we're going to change the baseline. So here is the 2012 high fire threat map, and here is the 2020 high burn probability map. So we can see that while there has probably been some change on the ground in terms of fuel between 2012 and 2020, it's not been this extreme. So most of this change is coming from um, data source and methodology changes with the Forest Service. And here you can see the proposed changes. So baseline will change from 1.1 to 3.7 and the target will change from 0.9 to 3.1. What we see is also that the base year has changed, so now we're rebaselining, so now the new base year will be 2020. And what we basically did was we set the um, previous range, so 2014 to 2040, we cut that range down 2020 to 2040, and we applied a proportional reduction since we're now 
partway through that previous time period. So 3.7 to 3.1 is consistent across this now shorter time period with the prior measure. And then for employment, uh, we're looking at 1.8 instead of 2.9 and 1.6 instead of 2.5 for the target. Um, and then we're again changing that base year to 2020. I'm not, now going to pass off to Alvin for the next measure, and then we can circle back for questions. So the other area under Metro Vision we are proposing to amend measures and targets are the number of traffic fatalities measure, whereas the previous ones are a result of data. This one is a result of uh, recent board guidance, recent board actions, and practice at Dr. Cog since 2020. So this measure tracks the number of traffic-related fatalities across all the different modes in our region. Um, back in 2020, as Emily just explained, we did adopt taking action on Regional Vision Zero that shifted our approach toward safety in the region, so loss of life is not an acceptable price to pay for mobility. Since then, we have started to align a lot of our different planning processes to that target of zero. Um, so based on that, a recent board action with our federal performance measures and hopeful board action later this week related to the update to take an action on regional vision zero. We're looking to change our baseline and our target values in Metro vision to align with this larger philosophy. So as with the previous measures, the baseline and baseline year will be re reset. Um, so 2020 to mark that original adoption of taking action on regional vision zero, zero when we shifted our philosophy, um, that would record our new baseline value of 254. We will keep our target year of 2040 with our new target of zero. Um, 2040 aligns with previous uh, guidance we got from the board after adoption of taking action on regional vision zero. We did a quick poll to see what was most appropriate for us as a region, recognizing the various communities that exist in, in the Denver region, when could they potentially achieve zero and what's appropriate for them. That concludes our brief presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there questions for uh, Alvin or Zachary? Director Cook. Um, this is for Dr. Feldman. Um, I went to a town hall in Jeff Jeffco recently, and they were they're updating their wildfire protection plan, and um, they've adjusted the location of the wildland urban interface. Is, does that correlate to your high burn probability map? Um, um, yes, yeah, so this the map is produced by the Forest Service, and they have a separate um, urban interface map. And I'm not an expert in kind of how they do the modeling, but my my understanding is it's, it's the same model producing the um, burn probabilities as when they're also drawing that urban um, uh, interface. So they're looking at um, density of housing and um, kind of other measures from, from both on the ground, but also satellite imagery. So um, kind of another set of measures from the Forest Service. It, uh, they're, they haven't adopted the new one, but if I understood it correctly, about 47% of the county currently is in that wooey zone where the new line would have it like upwards of 90%, so a good chunk of the suburban areas as well. So okay, yeah, I, I misunderstood. There's a, so um, Jeffco may have a, their boundary line, but also the Forest Service has another. They also have a, um, a designation for kind of that interface line. Not sure whether those necessarily line up. And those those are slightly different. I uh, know that uh, um, I don't appear on the burn probability map, my home, but uh, I know that for the wildfire urban interface, uh, there is at least one insurance company that will not insure in my neighborhood and. You know, it's we're all bluegrass and um, tall trees that are separated, and it seems kind of odd. But I, I think the multiple types of reporting and uh, the changes 
the really drastic changes uh, have baffled the insurance companies into like, I'm out of here. Um, we're seeing the same with condominiums as well. And uh, their monthly um, amounts for dues have increased significantly because of the insurance costs for you know, certainly hail, but fire as well. Other, yes. Yes, uh, as a representative of an insurance company, here's what I will tell you. We spend a lot of time <laughs> thinking about you. this, but for the benefits of your communities, so the WUI has always been a good guideline and a guide wire for insurers and others to determine wildfire risk. We no longer use the WUI, right? Uh, because what we saw with the Marshall Fire, what we see with this mapping, uh, it's not just the WUI that's at risk, uh, the wild and urban interface. Every community is at risk because of winds, because of changing climate, because of density, because of fire response time and the like. So on an insurance basis, here's what I'll tell you. It is devastating for us when we can't insure someone because we don't want to turn away business. What, what company grows by, by telling you we can't work with you, right? Um, what the benefit that we see in Colorado at a state level with the insurers, with our lawmakers, with regulators, uh, we're allowed to set rate at a pretty responsible pace. So unlike what we've seen in California, where insurers won't insure anyone and all the majors are pulling out, I don't think we'll get to that point in Colorado. Um, I think we're going to continue to be able to insure most folks. But to your point, Madam Chair, uh, you're going to see rate increases on everything. Uh, and that's the price we pay for insurance. Fundamentally, the risks of uh, changing climate are borne disproportionately by the insurance industry. And so that's where we're going to be. But uh, Colorado, as we've seen with this presentation, does an exceptional job at mapping. And we have a lot more data here than we do, for example, in Wisconsin, Minnesota, a state that you don't think are fire prone, but actually are. Thank you for that. And good to know that at least as a general rule, we won't lose insurability entirely. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Director Mills. I'm also, I'm also in the insurance industry. I'm, I'm at a local agency. And I can tell you there's a lot of volatility in the industry as well. Um, I have one carrier that's completely pulling out of the state, which is going to decrease competition, which also leads to increased premiums. So um, I don't see it getting any better this year. I actually see your homeowner's policies increasing significantly again this year, but again, I don't set the rate. <laughs> no, right, don't shoot the messenger, right? <laughs> I think that's, that's valid. And I pay uh, these for premiums too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Well, and I think, uh, I think the increased risk rating uh, as, as well as the significant property uh, value increases really hit people hard. Double whammy. Other questions? It was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, active transportation plan update from Aaron Valeri. Uh, senior Active Transportation Planner, and I hope I said that right, Aaron. Hillary. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you all. Uh, my name is Aaron Villery. I'm the Senior Active Transportation Planner uh, here at Dr. Cog, and I uh, just wanted to give uh, an informational update about uh, an exciting project that we have been working towards for a bit and are getting ready to, to kick off. Uh, which is an update to the active transportation plan. Uh, so this is uh, a major update to, we have a, a currently uh, adopted uh, active transportation plan that was completed in 2019. And so this is a major update um, from, from front to back uh, of that plan. Um, it has been identified as part of our, our current uh, uh, UPWP. Um, and really the goal of this plan is, is to support walking, bicycling, and other modes of active transportation throughout the region. Um, it, the, the goal of the plan is uh, to deliver recommendations about Dr. Cog's internal programs and policies and, and, um, and projects, but also to um, provide guidance um, and uh, strength and collaboration among our partners and member governments. Um, and really the goal of this is to respond to emerging trends and challenges in active mobility. Uh, we've had a, a pretty eventful five years since the last plan was adopted, uh, and it's, it's an exciting opportunity to um, 
to make some changes and, and make it that way. Um, so just to, to kind of set the foundation of, of why we're doing this now and, and why this is um, a real priority. Uh, first of all, um, uh, the last time I was, I was talking to this committee was in November, uh, presenting the active modes crash report that we completed, um, where we, we really talked about the pedestrian safety crisis. This is both national and regional, that uh, pedestrian um, fatalities and injuries uh, have increased over the last decade. Um, and of course, this supports our, our Vision Zero goal, but uh, this is sort of, uh, it, you know, a, a keystone of the plan is, is how to address that uh, pedestrian safety crisis um, and to make it safer for people bicycle, or people walking especially. Um, other things that we've learned from, uh, you know, our conversations with member governments and partners is escalating costs to implement projects uh, are a barrier for uh, rolling out these plans. And so, um, Developing some some guidance and um, and sharing practices uh, around that is is a priority. Um, addressing the the many new and emerging modes uh, that are uh, using and and um, uh, requiring space uh, in active transportation infrastructure, and so kind of getting our hands around some of those challenges, and then of course addressing congestion and air quality as the region go, grows. That uh, providing active transportation uh, infrastructure and and mobility is is key to. Um, nurturing an efficient transportation system. Also, some really exciting innovations that the Denver region has really put it, itself forward as, um, as a leader in this space. Uh, so uh, codifying some of the uh, emerging multimodal design best practices um, is a real opportunity here. Um, some of our members uh, have really taken some new approaches to, to planning and project delivery that we want to capture and, and make sure to uh, share among, among partners. Uh, again, new device types on the roadway, uh, new options for people of all ages and abilities. This is a really uh, big opportunity is, is how do we uh, break down barriers for different types of users um, to, to use active transportation. Uh, new public incentive programs that you all are aware of, uh, the Colorado, um, the state of Colorado and the Denver region have emerged as, as leaders, for instance, e-bike incentive programs. And so this is a really interesting opportunity to capture some of those changes. Um, and then new ways to fund um, and deliver these projects. And then finally, just to capture the shifting landscape around uh, walking, bicycling, um, and active mobility, COVID-19, uh, the pandemic really changed travel habits, and we've sort of started to settle back into a new normal. And so um, understanding how that shifting landscape is changing the way that, ways that people want to move, um, the evolution of shared micromobility that since the last plan uh, was adopted, we've, we've moved station-based uh, um, uh, bike share system in the Denver area, certainly to um, many more private operators and uh, dockless systems. And so um, uh, we'll be collaborating with parallel efforts to um, capture policies and, and programs around shared micromobility, the expansion of e-bikes and other uh, new types of devices. And then um, just keeping in mind that uh, the ways that people make decisions about how to travel and increasing cost burden and economic pressure um, and, and how that uh, relates to, to travel choices and travel options and providing mobility. So the project purpose is to is really you know there's there's two pieces that I alluded to earlier. It's to set a vision for active transportation, so for walking and bicycling, um, and micromobility in the region to really set a vision of, of where we want to go, what are our goals um, for unlocking this kind of movement for for people. Um, the plan itself uh, aims to provide tools and guidance, principally for member governments. So we we want to provide a forum to bring together. Um, our members and to share practices and and develop some really strong uh, a really strong toolkit for um, for local agencies to implement their own projects and programs and then also to identify actions for Dr. Cog to undertake to support these actions. We've reviewed the recommendations from the 2019 plan and have made a lot of progress uh, in, in implementing recommendations. So we really want to uh, advance further. So. Um, so we are at the tail end of a, uh, a consultant procurement process. Um, so we have put together a scope and we are um, uh, just about to kick off with a consultant team to help us deliver this and just wanted to go over the high level scope elements uh, that we're really uh, hoping to focus on with this plan. Um, so first of all, uh, the biggest um, opportunity and goal for us is really robust member and stakeholder 
uh, engagement. Um, so really building capacity among our member governments to, to do the work and really having a, um, a strategic and, and focused uh, engagement process that brings in members of the public, brings in uh, specific groups that um, experience barriers and, and really having really substantive engagement that can be responsive to um, hoping to open up active transportation for more folks. And so the engagement process is, is really the, the centerpiece of this scope. Um, we want to update our active transportation network. This is used principally um, as part of our, our TIP program, but um, we have a three-part network that we're planning to update our regional active transportation corridors, our short trip opportunity zones, and our pedestrian focus areas that we want to review how travel patterns have changed and uh, what those networks should be as we go into the uh, next planning period. Um, we want to develop guidance for accelerating the completion of the regional pedestrian network. We call this our, our sidewalk delivery guide, um, which is really thinking about that there's a, um, a significant documented gap in complete sidewalk networks throughout the region and, and uh, pedestrian infrastructure, and so developing some guidance to help uh, our local partners um, complete those networks and provide um, accessible, compliant uh, facilities for for all users. Um, we want to provide updated guidance for emerging micromobility. So we're really thinking this is responsive to um, some member feedback that, you know, as e-bikes and cargo bikes and scooters and all these different things are, are using active transportation infrastructure, we want to develop just some shared practices around um, how can facilities be designed to, to accommodate these different types of users and what are some of the emerging practices from um, both regionally and, the, and nationally as well. Um, so uh, developing guidance around that. Um, we're excited to uh, analyze or to do an analysis of the economic benefits around active transportation investments. So we really want to tell that story about what is, you know, the, the, the cost of, of uh, delivering some of these types of infrastructure and, and programs and, and what are the potential benefits for cities, for local economies, um, uh, for local businesses. Um, excited to complete that analysis, an assessment of Dr. Cog's policies and programs, um, making new recommendations about how we can better support uh, extra transportation around the region, or some specific actions we can take, and then producing an actionable plan that is, um, that is accessible, that is engaging, and that really uh, helps carry forward uh, over the next five to ten years. Um, so the ask that I would like to put forward today, we're, we're starting to build out our plan advisory group, so we're um, excited to engage um, very deeply over the next uh, uh, 18 months uh, with Dr. Cog's staff, with our member governments, with our partners at CDOT and RTD, and we really are thinking about how to engage across agencies and to bring in different subject matter experts, so we are uh, intending to have a, a core advisory group that will sort of shepherd the plan along and be a, uh, involved in, in crafting the plan vision and deliverables and um, uh, being involved in different review cycles, but also bringing in uh, people at key intervals um, who have real subject matter expertise. So some of the folks we're thinking about, of course, are pedestrian program managers, bicycle program managers, um, ADA coordinators within uh, cities and counties, um, and then safe process school managers, but the ask that I'll put forward today um, is if you're thinking about people uh, within your agencies or your localities, um, that uh, to, uh, please make sure to help us get the word out and so we can engage them. Um, we're also uh, building up our community advisory groups of the, if there are important local partners. These are some of the different types of partners that, that we have on our um, on our distribution list, but um, just thinking about uh, who some of the different community advisors who can really help uh, give sharp perspectives um, and and both within the transportation space, so safe streets and bicycle and pedestrian or organizations, parks and rec districts, TMAs, um, but also some people who might have a different lens on our biking and walking, so accessibility advocates, business improvement districts, um, social clubs, bike shops, uh, micro mobility operators. Um, really sort of seeking in that guidance on, on who are the important partners that are going to give us a good uh, rounded perspective. Just to give you a, a broad overview of the schedule, we're kicking off this spring and we're planning to take about 18 months um, to start to finish um, to develop the, uh, the different deliverables and guidance pieces and to conduct stakeholder engagement, public engagement uh, throughout the process essentially. So uh, we are hoping to finish 
um, around the summer of next year. Um, but that is our trajectory. And so with that, I appreciate your time and uh, I would be happy to answer any questions, but just wanted to put my contact information up as well. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, Director Stewart. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. So I see that you have a CDOT um, on here as part of your um, stakeholder team. I hope you're working with the Department of Transit and Rail, and the reason I'm saying that is because CDOT has a, a plan for mobility hubs all along I-25, and those mobility hubs are really the access for active transportation so that people who need to get into either transit or into their cars or whatever will have that ability at those mobility hubs to choose another form of, of transportation to get to the last mile on either side. And um, we've done a good job about putting in some mobility hubs north of the I-25 area of Dr. Cog, a little bit north of Dr. Cog area. But internally, that's a mechanism that can really accommodate active transportation. And when you're looking at um, other agencies to get involved, many of us are involved in, um, in local coalitions. For example, uh, North Area Transportation Alliance, of which Mayor, Mayor Mills was the chair just recently, they talk a lot about um, being able to give input to um, how to do that first last mile or how to um, partner with local matches and those kinds of things. And um, the, I set the uh, uh, SH7 coalition as well, uh, there's an active group there, and I think they'd be very interested in, in both the NADA area and uh, State Highway 7. Uh, there are mobility hubs planned for both of those areas. So hopefully you'll be able to reach out. And I think Department of Transit and Rail is the area within our CDOT uh, area that, that has that information about what's planned at each of those mobility hubs. Absolutely. Um, I really appreciate the piece of feedback, and we've been um, really delighted uh, the sort of level of collaboration we've are even before we've kicked off that we've been able to have with different folks in CDOT. I, I appreciate the um, specific tip on uh, transit and rail. Uh, we've principally been active transportation folks who are also, of course, updating CDOT's. Uh, so, um, and I think that it points to how much transit has changed in the last these new services and, and actions is, is crucial. Um, thank you. Other questions? Director Guzman. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, the last slide about who you're working with, just a thought. Um, have you reached out to schools? Have you reached out to rec centers? Have you reached out to youth clubs like the Boys and Girls Clubs? Um, and have you looked at um, facilities? aging adults, senior centers, where people are more likely to go for exercise activity or need to use other forms of transportation, including everything in your presentation, um, as a way of accessing some input, valuable input, from some of the most vulnerable parts of the community. Absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so as, as we furnish this list, I, I really appreciate the, those suggestions. And um, um, We'll continue to, um, to loop in groups like that. I'll, the one thing that I'll say that we're really excited uh, about doing is uh, spending a lot of our engagement time doing targeted focus groups um, uh, with some of those groups that, you know, the, the, the term that I like to hold in my mind is targeted universalism about who are the specific groups that have barriers, you know, school-age children uh, is a great example of a large driving population. Uh, uh, older adults, certainly, we... Uh, we're partnering with our area agency on aging um, to really sit down with those uh, different groups of people um, and have really deep substantive discussions about what are their barriers. And so that is something that's slated for this fall that we'd like to, uh, we're really um, focus our efforts on, on who are different groups that we've identified um, that experience barriers to using the transportation system and how can we best leverage So absolutely. Thank you. Director Mulvey. It, it occurs to me that there's a, somewhere between the recipients of AAA benefits and down the line to people who might need to bike and work to work every day, and then managing that with new residential development of people who are downsizing, who are, say, in that over 55 group but not quite AAA group, 
And so I wonder then if in your community advisory group, you might include some of those new developments that are a building for over 55, whether it's multifamily or reduced size single family or single family attached. Somehow and capture that. Just to, I'm thinking out loud because it's a new thought, but is there a way to capture that? Because those folks, some of which I met with yesterday, are very happy that they will be able to potentially ride their bike to a train nearby where they just bought a house at. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. And um, I think it's something that we're strategizing. I think it's a, it's a wonderful point. You know, I, I think personally, if parents live in a plus community that is transit accessible, and that's like a really great use case exactly. Um, for thinking about these, you know, where are the opportunities to, to capture short trips? Um, uh, I, I think the place that we're starting from is trying to be really shrewd about our analysis to really capture, you know, where is growth and development happening um, and where are some of the opportunities that we're see more development come up um, that we can kind of bake in, um, bike and walk access. Uh, guidance can we provide uh, to our, our members so that as those developments are, um, are being built that they have, you know, a connected walk and bike infrastructure built in. Um, in terms of the engagement, I, I think it's something we're, we're thinking through and are seeking guidance on. So I, I, I appreciate the, the suggestion and input. And um, we're really thinking that through, you know, where are the opportunities as population changes and goes through different life stages? And, you know, as, as people are sort of reaching new milestones where they're thinking about their travel habits, you know, what are the opportunities um, to unlock? biking and walking and, and to shift some of those car trips and a new mobility. Thank you, Director Adams. Uh, first of all, excellent job. Thank you for, uh, for doing that. One thought, and it may be included in what you call business improvement districts, but, but I do think we should be including some subset of our development communities that are actually building some of these projects that some of this uh, activity may be associated with. So I don't know how you've got them contemplated in your, uh, you know, community advisory groups, but I, that's the only thing I would add. Yeah, and I think that's um, kind of consistent with, with Director Mulvey's comment too, it sounds like, of like actually planning and directing these new um, So I think that's a great piece of guidance that, you know, um, uh, when we think of business improvement districts, really thinking of, or, or, or partnership as but um, I think that's a great piece of, of advice and um, something that, that we can uh, consider really seriously about how do we best engage these. So. Thank you, Director Mills. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you for your presentation. I just want to also echo a lot of what uh, Commissioner Stewart is getting involved with the uh, North Area Transit Alliance and all them, maybe get with them on presentations coming up. I know about the fourth Thursday of the month. This one is next. I've already got that plan. So definitely get involved with them and the Highway 7 Coalition as well um, regarding that mobility hub that Commissioner Stewart talked about. We meet quarterly with that group as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Other questions for Aaron? All right, thank you. Wonderful presentation, and thanks for asking for our ideas on who else. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, our administrative items, uh, member uh, uh, member updates. CDOT first. Well, thank you. I'll use the chair's prerogative and go first, and then I'll turn it over to Commissioner Cook and then Commissioner Adams. Uh, first of all, I have the answer to the E-470 toll credits. They belong to the state texted Herman and he knew right away. <laughs> uh, this week we have our Transportation Commission. It's going to be interesting because we are um, taking uh, an extra five hours in our, in our week to um, do a field trip. And the field trip is going to consist of a number of things. 
as you know, we have six new commissioners out of 11, and uh, some of this will be replicative and updates to many of us, but to a lot of the new people, are there are uh, things that we've been referencing that they have no idea what it is, they don't know what it is or where it is or how it impacts our decision making. Um, we uh, we have just lost one of our commissioners. Uh, we had a resignation this week from uh, Commissioner Megan Vasquez uh, from District 11. District 11 is the eastern part of the of uh, Region 4. Um, she's had some health issues and she resigned, so we'll be getting a new commissioner to replace her, but I don't know how long that will take, but I wanted to let you know that. Uh, so the three places that we are going to um, look at in our field trip um, and their significance is uh, Central 70. Uh, many of the commissioners that are on had no idea of what that public-private partnership was, what it looks like now that it's done. And I think um, those of you who pay attention to the news know that we're starting dynamic pricing um, on the toll revenues there. And so we'll get an update on how that's going. It's just started. Um, it's confusing to people. Um, my husband asked, if you get in at a dollar fifty and it changes <laughs> while you're in there to a dollar seventy five are you gonna have are you how do you and I've assured him if you get in at a dollar fifty that's what you pay <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think those are reasonable questions they are. <laughs> I think they are. Um, uh, so uh, that will be an update for us. Uh, we're going to go to Colorado Air and Spaceport um, to have lunch with the Aeronautical Board. You know, the Aeronautical Board is part of CDOT, but not directed by CDOT and not part of TC, Transportation Commission. It's, a, it's an anomaly, but um, part of what we call CDOT. So uh, once, a, once a year, we have a, a joint lunch with them, and uh, they tell us what they're doing, and uh, it's always interesting because the component we don't have much to do with. And uh, you might be interested to know we have uh, two um, water landing airports in the state of Colorado, which I think is really? uh, interesting, yes. So um, I don't remember which two they are, but they're in the mountains. <laughs> Uh, so we always learn a lot about that, and that's at Front Range um, Airport. And then the last one that we're going to do is Burnham Yard. You may have heard of Burnham Yard. It's 58 acres on the east side of I-25 at about 13th, I think. And uh, what is it, Ron? What do you think it is? Like 13th Street or somewhere like that? It's just down to 18th. Um, and CDOT paid $50 million for that property a couple of years ago with the understanding that we would do some, uh, uh, it's an old rail yard, uh, has a rail track going through it, has some uh, semi-historic buildings on it that probably we'd want to keep. Um, and it, uh, the reason we, we bought it was to be able to do a NEPA evaluation um, to determine um, alternatives uh, that could improve local and regional transportation options in and around the site, and then also allow for um, development uh, that could that could be supported. And so, um, what's interesting about this now is there's there's room there for RTD um, Front Range Rail. Um, if you look at that site, you can sort of envision maybe Santa Fe Rail Yard, where you've got mixed use, you've got some. Uh, residential and you've got some commercial and that sort of thing. Um, so we'll we'll go and take a look at that and get an update on what's happening um, with Burnham Yard. And then finally, I just want to give my two cents about the legislative bills that are being imposed on CDOT. And while you may see that it says CDOT supports, I want to be clear that CDOT and Transportation Commission are not the same entity and that the Transportation Commission has not as a body weighed in and taken a position on any of these bills that affect CDOT. If you want my opinion, my number is 303-263-3079. <laughs> and I think you could reach out to any of the people on Transportation Commission. Um, I'm not sure what their opinions are because we haven't discussed it. So thank you. And now, uh, Commissioner Cook. Ta -da -da. <laughs> <laughs> I can't top that. Nothing to add. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. I, I don't have anything for that. Oh, okay. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, Darius, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would just add on for the uh, Transportation Commission tomorrow, um, a related item for Dr. Cog is the acceptance uh, or discussion of the acceptance of the greenhouse gas uh, report as part of the um, TIP process. So that will be a conversation at the workshop and a potential decision item for the Commission on Thursday as well. And that's it for me. Thank you. Um, Next up is RTD. Brian, would you like to start? What I will do is allow our board of directors to go first and then I'll add anything that seems pertinent. Thank you, Chair. How about now, better? Yeah. Okay, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to uh, Director Guzman. Um, a few things going on at RTD, I don't know if you've heard, but... <laughs> So a couple things that are, are important. Um, as you know, last year we began something called the Northwest Rail Peak Service Feasibility Study to study the feasibility of completing in some fashion the Northwest Rail Line from Denver to Longmont. Um, so we, we, we hired uh, HDR, I believe, to do this, this job, $8 million feasibility study. And because it, we really hadn't done a feasibility study since before 2004, when the Fast Tracks initiative had passed. So things have changed kind of significantly in, in that time frame, it's 20 years ago. So we want to see still a feasible project. Are people going to ride this rail if we spend the billion plus dollars to make it happen? And, and where does that money come from? Things like that. So that feasibility study should be complete in the next 30 to 60 days and will come before our board and the board will be given the data. This is what it would take to make this happen. This is what it would cost. This is how many people might ride it. And then we will determine what our options are from let's go full bore uh, to shelve it, it's, it's not feasible, to anything in between, all kinds of options in between. So we're eager to get that going um, and, and you know, base our decisions on a study that gives us data, I think, instead of saying we want to do something and then doing the study afterwards. We also have a big rail replacement project and a coping panel replacement projects that are underway. So as many of you know, many of the light rail lines downtown, those rails are over 30 years old. And trains go over them every single day and wear them down to the nub, right? So we we're, we're, have a big project to replace a lot of those rails. We've, uh, we've got a project management team to help us get through that in a, in a, in a good and timely fashion. There will be impacts on on travel, and there's just no way around that. But when when safety is the goal, we have to do it regardless. So uh, that's that's a couple of the big things that are going on. There's something else that's happened recently uh, has to do with some legislation that has been proposed regarding uh, the RTD board of directors and 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 some things about how we operate. I'm going to talk primarily about the impacts or the proposals regarding the board of directors uh, so, so that you, you, these are my opinion and, and Director Guzman can give you his opinion. I think we're probably pretty aligned on most of these things. The, the legislation has some other things put in there that you know obligate Dr. Cog to do some things and obligate CDOT to I don't know, train our bus drivers or something like that. Um, I, I see those primarily as throwaway issues. Uh, some of the other things that are in there are, are, are things that we already do, and, and apparently the proposers have no idea what we do. <laughs> so, so a couple of reasons. So, so, so ultimately, the board will go from 15 members to seven in the future, right? Where there's going to be a two-year transition period, uh, and then after that, it's going to be this five plus two. Uh, and I say five plus two because there are going to be five elected, two appointed by the governor. The reason that the, the bill proponents say they need this change is to create a more professional board and a more nimble board that have been stated. Now, the last time I was here two meetings ago, I, I gave you my input on the professional board and the makeup of this current board and their backgrounds, our background. And, and then if you're going from an elected board to an elected board, how do you ensure Professionalism. I still haven't figured that one out yet, but I think maybe I have. Um, so 
we, they also say they want a more nimble board. We're too big, 15 people. We covered almost 2,400 square miles, 3.2 million people. Do you know how many House and Senate seats uh, are, are in that same RTD district? 61. So I know they do different things than, than we do, but I, I don't think the nimble argument works because any governmental body or quasi-governmental body works at the speed of government, and it has to, right? It has to by law in a lot of instances, and it has to because we need to take comment and public input and stakeholder input so things take time to get through the system as it does with any um, uh, city government or, or county government as well. So um, the fact that we have 15 members versus seven members, it, no impact on, on whatever this nimbleness concept is. You, you know, sometimes our meetings go later, okay, but we've never had to work on a Sunday. But we, so we, so we, we do get our work done. Um, and I'll talk about this concept of the elected board. So there's two appointed by the governor, five elected. And they're all elected at large, okay? So at large means this 2,400 square mile, 3.2 million person district, bigger than any congressional district in Colorado, all to get a $35,000 job. Um, so, so there will be three districts, so, but they'll still be elected at large. So they'll represent a million people each, and the other two at-large seats that are elected represent three million people. So here's the likely outcome on, the, on this new elected board of, of five people. You're either going to get people that will gather signatures, 250 signatures, still the requirement, and then sit back and see what happens because you can't possibly campaign in, in this area. So, so what kind of person would do that? By somebody not very committed to, or the job itself. So um, that's just my guess. The, the other more likely option is the bill also provides that when there are vacancies in this elected board, they are no longer appointed the way they, they are now by the local entities, the local counties uh, that they represent, but the governor will appoint those vacancies. So. I think that that says a lot. And, and ultimately, you know, there's nothing in the bill, nothing stated in the bill, and nothing that I can figure out in the bill that benefits the customer, the rider of RTD. How does any of these changes benefit the customer? And in fact, I think that there is no benefit. There's a negative impact because now you go from 15 directors who, who can actually represent their communities and, and talk to the people in their communities that will no longer be able to do that. As, as Mayor Mills knows, once a month, I and Director Whitmore host a mayor's breakfast. Mayor Mills comes and we've got the mayor from Thornton, from North Glen, from Westminster, from Commerce City come, and we talk about the issues in their communities. When you represent 3 million people, the, the Dr. Cog area was a 42, 44 community mayors and communities. Yeah, so that's going to be a little more difficult to, to get the impact uh, and, and determine what the needs of the community the issue. That's all I have. Thank you, uh, Director Guzman. Thank you, Director Guzman, District CRTD. Um, all of that, <laughs> plus a uh, gentle reminder, thank you to Ms. Piggy and Kermit the Frog. Um, really, uh, the Muppet uh, exhibit that was at the Denver Art Museum allowed the petitioners in 1980 to gather enough signatures to make this a statewide, not just a regional issue, and it passed to create an elected board by 83%. The bill's gonna reduce diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, take away your voted voice and your representation at that table. And although I may not be a doctor by PhD or otherwise, I am a doctor in customer service with more than 40 years of retail and restaurant experience. Understanding how customers look at a system and use a system and rely on a system, that's my area and angle of expertise. You know, I speak a few languages, about 17 total, more than anybody I know, 
and that I work with on a daily basis here in Colorado. And so if that doesn't qualify me to be able to communicate with community properly, I don't know what professional looks like. Apparently I am mistaken. <clears throat> so outside of the personal attacks on this bill, it does not give any further money. And as you know, if you want a world-class system, you better have a world-class budget. Let's not fool ourselves. This does not do that. And we all know the reality. We want it to be reliable. We want it to be dependable. We want to know where we're at, where we're going, when we're going to get there. We're trying. We're doing the best with what we've got, but considering that this is a taxpayer paid for, 75% of our operating budget comes from a sales and use tax paid directly to the agency through the counties, not through the state. And we're 44th in the nation for funding with the largest regional transportation district in the nation. I think we're doing pretty damn well for a bunch of elected people who somebody somewhere decided we're not professional enough to actually do this work. So I think that y'all should consider that because that accusation reflects poorly on you as voters and electors. Um, to that end, we will have a meeting tonight at 4.30. Uh, it's been called by the chair. You can tune in rtd-denver.com and you can find the links through the board office part of the website. A Couple of things that you should know about. We started our transit assistant grant program. The announcement went out and we have awarded 181 program participants for 2024 over um, the next year to receive a million dollars in grant funding, anything from $250 to $50,000 in free fair media. It does require reporting. It's meant for the use of 501c3s and government agencies to help folks get to where they need to be who have a need for public transportation. Um, the board allotted that money last year in our budgeting process, which we are now beginning this year. Um, and I look forward to continuing that program if at all possible, and that's made possible by your generous support of RTD through your sales and use tax payments. Um, RTD, Denver, and Aurora have gone after and partnered for uh, infrastructure grant, and we're still trying to get that money. Um, so anything that you can do to lend a, a bit of a push to your legislators to help us get that money drawn down uh, would be really important for the East Colfax BRT. By the way, that would be the largest grant drawn down in the entire state of Colorado, if we can get that. So we're working on it really hard. We did receive a $2 million earmark from Senator Hickenlooper to study the South Federal BRT planning and uh, reconstruction down there. I'm really proud to say that I worked on that with him. Bowville, Illyria, and, um, and the National Western Area have a need for access for pedestrian safety purposes from the end of the end line on Brighton Boulevard over to the CSU Spur campus. We've also received some funding from that. So for all the people saying we're not going after federal funds, I say I think you're crazy. Um, and then we talked about the light rail interruptions. Sorry, but your safety comes first. And I would rather you have to figure out how to maneuver around the city like the rest of us poor folk do that rely on public transportation for a few months while we can get that construction done and get those rail lines up and running to where they need to be um, without interruption and without problems. And it's a slight inconvenience for these couple of summers, but I promise you this is well worth it. That's all I got. Thank you. <clears throat> Director Welch, anything to add? <laughs> 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 Thank you, <laughs> Chair Shaw. The, I'll just mention a couple of things. The, you know, the staff, of course, has been asked to look at a lot of these legislative issues, and so we focus on those things where we believe we we can weigh in, and we stay away from the others where we believe we should not. But <laughs> I think everybody in this room knows that that uh, the planning process that goes on between Dr. Cog and RTD and CDOT is is very clearly clarified, and and frankly recorded in state and federal legislation, and we adhere to it very tightly as the three agencies. And I, I could include all of our stakeholder municipalities as well. For example, Dr. Cog has final say over any system expansion, any, any fixed guideway that RTD wants to do. There's a good reason for that. Those were not recorded in state legislation accidentally. There's a purpose to ensure that we do have a tightly integrated planning process. So sometimes when I hear about legislative efforts that mention additional um, levels of coordination between Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD, I, I just, I'm puzzled because I believe that we're doing a really, really good job um, of coordinating together with our municipalities. Everything that happens in this region 
I don't think people are going to point out, well, that showed a lack of coordination. In fact, I think it's just the opposite. We're very proud of the way that we work together to, to, uh, to address the needs of our collective customers. So I, I know you all know that, but I think it's always worth keeping that in mind. One other thing that I'll mention, um, we just started a pilot that was based upon a grant from FTA called Advanced Innovation Mobility. And the only thing I want to highlight about this pilot, what it does is it allows a, a customer to purchase a ticket that includes the ability to link together a number of different things, which is one of the things that transit and mobility providers are trying to do. And we, we actually have this pilot. And I just wanted to highlight what I was just saying. I'll, I'll tell you who the partners are on this because it, 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 I think it's significant that we just don't do plans together. We implement things. So through a partnership between FTA, CDOT, the Transit App, Masabi, Denver South TMA, the City of Lone Tree, Via Mobility Services, Boulder B-Cycle, and Lyft. So you get all those agencies together so that with one application, not jumping around between all kinds of things, you can book trips together. So let's say you were in Colorado Springs and you wanted to get all the way to Denver Union Station and you wanted to include a bicycle and you wanted it. Now you can do it all together without it's seamless. And those are the kind of things. If you remember Mobility Choice Blueprint, Dr. Cog, the Advanced Mobility Partnership, Hey, I think Emily's not here, but shout out to Dr. Cog for this is how these things happen. And I think it's because we do work together so well. So I don't have anything else to add, but especially <laughs> with what else is going on. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been most informative, and I, for one, appreciate it very much. Um, sometimes that personal uh, point of view is very helpful. Thank you. Um, we have uh, Mike Silverstein, who is not here, so we will not hear from the RAC. Uh, other matters from members? Hearing none, our next meeting is May 14th, and it is, uh, oh, parking vouchers from Cam, the magic person here in the room. It's 10:10, and we are adjourned. Thank you.